Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them that hate him flee before his face. Words taken from today's introit for the Holy Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now these words of the introit this morning come from Psalm 67 and are held by great saints and exorcists like St. Athanasius and St. Anthony of the Desert to be among the most powerful words of the sacred scriptures against the devil. Whenever the evil fiends of hell attack St. Anthony in the desert, these are the words he would often pronounce against them. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, and let them that hate him flee before his face. Thus, not surprisingly, the church employs this same verse in key places of the official rites of exorcism. Now, how does God arise and scatter his enemies? How does he fulfill this passage he himself inspired? He does so through his only begotten Son, our Lord and King, Jesus Christ, through his passion, death, and resurrection, through the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And this is why the devil fell from the heavens like lightning in the first place. He saw the future coming of the Christ and his infinite sacrifice. The cross of Christ is what makes exorcisms possible. The cross of Christ is what makes exorcisms effective. We would be lost without the cross of Christ. Now we have the very same passion, death, and resurrection of this Christ given to each of us at every holy mass. Through this sacred ritual, all the grace is found in the sacraments and in the using of the sacramentals, including that of the rite of exorcism. All the graces flow from the sacred ritual, from the mass upon the world. No wonder why Padre Pio said it would be easier for the world to exist without the sun than without the mass. It's essential. In a word, through the Holy Mass, God arises and scatters his enemies down through time and space. In the lesson today, we heard how St. Paul converted from persecuting the church to serving her through these very same mysteries. In the gospel today, we heard how our blessed Lord charged them that they should tell no man. Throughout his public life and works, his majesty told nearly everyone that knew something of him, including demons, to be quiet and not reveal that he was the Christ. Now, why did he do this? Simply because our Lord does not reveal himself without reference to the cross. Since the cross was still in the future, he wanted his identity kept as hidden as possible until Calvary had arrived. When St. Peter, inspired by God the Father, infallibly declared our Lord to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, his majesty immediately told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to be put to a painful death and rise again. In his transfiguration on Mount Tabor, he discussed his exodus from this world with Moses and Elias. Exodus from the world, what's that? Calvary. When our blessed mother first revealed him at Cana in Galilee, he spoke of how his hour had not yet come. Clearly, he did not want to be known except in connection to the cross. As he said to the Jews in the temple, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am, I'm the Christ. The same is true for all time. And so we have the Holy Mass, which is in truth, teaching of the church, the representation of Calvary, making Calvary present again. This is where he especially wants us to approach him, to know him 
to love him and to call upon his name. And this is where he wants us to bring our sacrifices, our crosses, our troubles and trials. Are we uniting our sufferings with his at Mass? The saints always made sure they had a cross when they went to Mass. If they didn't have a cross, they went and picked one up to bring Christ something to offer. Consider the mysterious line from St. Paul to the Galatians. Very interesting. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, senseless Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been set forth crucified among you. Now notice it was Jesus Christ crucified that was set forth for them to see. How is it possible for people living, huh, in another time and place to see Christ crucified with their own eyes, but in and through the Holy Mass? As we have discussed many times, after the second consecration, the mysterium fidei, the mystery of the faith, as the windows to heaven and Calvary are opened, like a time door and a timeless door to heaven. At this point, the priest professes to our Heavenly Father that the oblation now on the altar is no longer an earthly offering, no more bread and wine, but the body and blood of His divine Son. The priest essentially says something like, Father of infinite holiness, the victim so long expected is here before Thee. Behold this thy eternal Son who suffered a bitter passion, rose again in glory from the grave, and ascended triumphantly into heaven. Here is thy Son on Calvary. Will you not accept this perfect and spotless sacrifice? Will you not arise and scatter our enemies and remove the permissions they have to hurt us and thy holy church? Now, in the gospel, we also hear of his majesty groaning as he performs a miracle. Once again, it's a reference to his passion and his death on the cross, without which he will not work such wonders. Cures are not cheap. They cost something. They require the death of the Son of Man. In the same line, Recall the famous passage from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself asketh for us with unspeakable groanings. Romans chapter 8. Now, having read many lives of the saints, it is hard to find one that literally groaned as some would interpret this passage today. No, this groaning is available to every Catholic through the Mass. It is the Holy Ghost making the connection for us between this particular time and place to that of Calvary, such that we can unite our sufferings, our crosses, our prayers and petitions with that of Christ groaning on the cross. Our groanings, our sufferings, our prayers, united to his groaning, being offered to God through the Mass. That's effective. That's pleasing to God. Let us then take advantage of this mysterious connection of our Lord's efficacious groaning by praying devoutly at Mass. Let us avoid having to get up and use the restrooms, moving around, distracting others. Do all that before Mass. This is a very, very important event. Let's take advantage of it. Let's not belittle it or demean it in any way we can avoid. Now humor me a little more. Perhaps we can think about what is going on in terms of prayer and perfection, what's going on at Mass. Now, it's a philosophical principle that when something is perfect, 
it is finished. It's done. It cannot be improved upon. If it could be improved upon, then it was not yet perfect to begin with. Now, if we were to review all of history, asking ourselves, who is the best of all prayers? Who's the best of all prayers? We would have to answer His Majesty the God-man, Christ the Lord. His prayers are the highest and most effective since they're the prayers of the second person of the Holy Trinity united to our human nature in Christ. Then we can ask, well, what would be the best time of his life where we could unite our prayers to his? Ah, that would be the time when he was offering the greatest gift to God, the greatest sacrifice, namely himself, completely, on the cross. That would be Calvary. Thus, the perfect prayer and the perfect prayer and the perfect time of prayer is Christ on Calvary. What is perfect cannot be repeated or improved upon, but it can be made present again. It can be represented through time and space by the power of God. That is what the Holy Mass is, folks. The making present of the perfect prayer, the perfect prayer, the perfect time of prayer, so that we can add ours unto His. Oh, how good it is to be Catholic, huh? How wonderful it is to be here. Do we know what we have? I think we would die, not of fright, but of love if we knew what the Mass really was. This means the best worship we can offer to God is the Holy Mass. It is the highest level of praise, adoration, thanksgiving, and petition we can offer. Now, humor me a little more. In philosophy and theology, we oftentimes learn something we're interested in by looking at the opposite. What is most opposite the Holy Mass but the so-called Black Mass of the Satanists, of which we've been hearing much about of late? Think about it. The third temptation of Christ was that He should bow down and worship Satan to gain the whole world. Clearly, the devil wants to be worshipped. Third temptation of Christ. He wants to be worshipped as God. Therefore, how does God want to be worshipped? Through the Mass, highest form, the Mass. Therefore, the devil wants to be worshipped in his own form of the Mass. What does this say about the Catholic Mass? It says we have the real thing. And the devil knows it. Amazing. He is not making a parody of the various rituals of other religions or Protestants. No. He wants a black mass to fulfill the third temptation of Christ. What is needed for Satan's black mass to be most effective, to be most pleasing to him? Well, among other things, a consecrated host stolen from our altar or from our tabernacle, he needs a consecrated host. Or even better, I hesitate to even say it, they need their own validly ordained priest. Sad to say this has happened and is still happening. That is priest consecrating for the sake of evil, which is an automatic excommunication reserved to the Holy See, to the Pope. Church reserves these. She calls them graviora delicta, very grave, delex, sins. Some of the worst things that can be committed on the earth. Probably the worst. In the canon law, it reads, for example, one of these reserved sins, throwing away the consecrated species or for a sacrilegious purpose, taking them away or keeping them, stealing hosts. Now, why are they coming to our churches to steal our hosts? They don't want a host from another church. They've made it known we only want it from a Catholic church or a valid consecration. 
Now, we know there's been many tabernacles stolen in the recent decades. This is going on. Now, why would they want one of our priests to sin in such a grave manner? Again, it screams out, as it were, it's because we have the real thing. Our priests have true sacramental power to consecrate. We have the real presence of Christ in our tabernacles. And the devil and his followers know it. It's good to be Catholic. You're in the right spot. Whatever the devil does, you want to do the opposite. Now, as for the Black Mass itself, there seems to be a variety, a couple of different varieties they could choose from. Now, the Civic Center in Oklahoma City next month, I hope it's canceled, but they're going to use Anton LaVey's Black Mass, the one he formulated from his studies. Yet each of these black masses is essentially a ritual characterized by the inversion of this particular mass, the traditional Latin mass. They are a parody of the mass. That's what these black masses are. Instead of our in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti, in troi ibo ad altari dei, the black mass begins by invoking their father and God, Satan. And I'm not going to start with those words because they're so blasphemous we shouldn't repeat them. But then, after they invoke him, they say, Intro ibo ad altari domini inferni. We're going unto the Lord of the inferno, unto the spirit of the depths, unto hell. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that faith is cogitare cum ascensione, to think with ascent. When we use our faith, we go to heaven, we ascend. We think of heavenly things. All through this Holy Mass, we strive to lift our minds and hearts to God. Sursum corda, we exclaim. Lift up your hearts. In the Black Mass, however, it's inverted. Those attending are to think with dissent. We strive to go up, they strive to go down. We have our Father above, they got their Father below. Now, in the third temptation of Christ, recall how the devil offered his majesty the whole world if only he would bow down and worship him. What was our Lord's response to the devil? Be gone, Satan. And the scriptures say the devil left him. Now, in the end of the Black Mass, not surprisingly, it's the opposite. They say something like, welcome, Satan, and he remains comes among them. In other words, the black mass gives the devil permissions to work in the lives of those who attend, to answer their petitions, to those who give themselves over to him. Whereas the true mass, when properly understood and prayed well, works to remove the permissions that the devil has obtained based upon our sinful lives. We can have those permissions removed at the Holy Mass. And he'll stop harassing us. It is no wonder then that many famous people have turned to the Black Mass to get a favor, to gain something of the world. Making the Black Mass a sort of representation of the third temptation of Christ. You want to understand what that thing is? There it is. It is the third temptation of Christ made present now Scary. Now, something like this happened in Paris, France, under the 17th century King Louis XIV, the so called Sun King. He had sadly fallen in with a mistress, an innocent girl, who later left the king to spend her life in a Paris Carmel to make reparation. But she was replaced by a most wicked woman, and maybe her replacement was by design. This woman was later discovered to have participated in something like three black masses with a real Catholic priest in order to secure and expand her position as the king's favorite. Keep in mind that this same king, Louis XIV, is the very one whom St. Margaret Mary petitioned to have France consecrated to the Sacred Heart 
and he failed to heed her request. As a result, the French Revolution came about and the explosion of the occult we are now experiencing started in that revolution. It grew out of that revolution. What I'm saying is that maybe his failure to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart has more causes than we want to admit. We should be enthroning the Sacred Heart in our homes to undo anything the devil is working on in our lives. But if you look at the French Revolution, Napoleon, shortly after it, was an avid palm reader. He would read your palm. He went down to Egypt and resurrected Egyptology and all things Egypt. Magic burst forth from all that. Josephine, his wife, consulted many occult sources for information and guidance. Occult activity has become more and more commonplace ever since. Now it has reached the level of public black masses. Make no mistake, many famous people have taken this route, including many Hollywood singers, actors, and comedians. Robin Williams, who recently committed suicide, is one example among many. Listen to his own words from an interview granted to U.S. Weekly back in 1999. Yeah, literally, it's like possession. All of a sudden, you're in. And because it's in front of a live audience, you just get this energy that just starts going. But there's also that thing. It is possession. In the old days, you'd be burned for it. But there is something empowering about it. I mean, it is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde where you really can become this other force. Robin Williams, 1999. Where did he pick up these demons? Did he attend a black mass? They often do. Did they have one set for him? Did he have one set for his intentions? Such behavior has been reported among many rock and roll stars, popular singers, as well as movie actors. They wanted the world. They bowed down to Satan and worshipped him. They got their fame. It is no secret that many of them could not bear their dark master and ended up falling into the devil's favorite temptation, despair, as Robin Williams did. Do we really want to watch possessed people act? Think about that next time you watch one of their movies. Who's really acting here? Listen to their songs. You want to listen to their songs? Who's really singing? You really want to laugh at their jokes? Who's really cracking them? Hollywood is providing us this sort of stuff. Oh, how good it is to be Catholic, to know that we have in this holy mass the Christ who prays perfectly. The perfect sacrifice of himself on the Calvary represented his groanings made available to us by the power of the Holy Ghost. The chance to offer our sufferings and sacrifices with his to make them count. The chance to have God arise and scatter his enemies and ours too, revoking all their permissions to harass us and our families. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.